we are a combination of cultures, a combination of identities. One of the um, uh, one of the Moravian ministers from Denmark put it perfectly last week, where he said, "Culture is a conversation," and I thought that just summed it up just in, in the most perfect way possible. I never heard it that simplified before, but he's like, "Culture is a conversation." And this is an opportunity, I think, for us as we move forward as a city, like so many places across America, to have conversations about what community means. Um, so people look at World Heritage like we're going to welcome people and people are going to come from all over and so on and so forth. And we will have some people that come here. The bigger opportunity in my mind for us is an internal one as far as like what the values are that the world has now recognized us for yeah. to live up to. Yeah. And that idea about like, how do we make sure everybody feels included? How do we make sure everybody has opportunity? How do we make sure? I mean, you've probably heard this before at God's Acre, you would have people that were rich and poor that were buried next to each other. Um, and that just doesn't happen usually in 2024. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a real opportunity for us internally as well to kind of think about who we want to be as a city. Welcome to Why Am I Talking, a podcast where the guests are so good, you'll wonder why the host is even talking. In each episode, you will hear one of the leaders of the Lehigh Valley's vibrant business hub. They will tell you the keys to their success, the mistakes they've made, and what they have in store for the future. Here is the host of Why Am I Talking from Why Am I Insurance, Jimmy Honachik. <laughs> Uh, that is me. I am Jimmy Hanachik here with another episode of Why Am I Talking and joined by Avery Pennell. That's me. That, <laughs> <laughs> that is you. And speaking of people, our guest today, I I am beyond excited. I've been bragging about it all week. <laughs> why, don't, why don't you fill the people in who we got today? All right, listeners, listen up. Turn up those volumes. We got the mayor of Bethlehem on the podcast. Mayor Reynolds was on our podcast. Yes. That man made time for us. And it was awesome. It was so great. Yeah. I learned so much. I knew that he was a good speaker, so I wasn't worried, but he exceeded my expectations. I know. I sat there and I was just like, <laughs> I, I never knew I enjoyed politics this much. Look at that. You're going to become <laughs> a politician. Well, let's <laughs> not go that far. Uh -huh. yeah. um, I'm not going to you know, waste any time here. I think we're just going to go right into it. Jump right in. Jump right Let's in. Go. So without further ado, uh, this is uh, Why Am I Talking with Mayor J. Willie Reynolds, and it's awesome. All right. Uh, we are live. This is Jimmy Hanachik, Why Am I Talking? And I am going to pause before I do this intro. Um, I named this podcast Why Am I Talking? Because the guests are going to be so good that I don't need to do any talking. And uh, Avery, I don't think it's ever lived up more to this moment right here. Uh, we have a lifelong Bethlehem resident, born, raised, um, magna cum laude from Moravian College. I don't even know what those words mean now. Um, youngest city council member in Bethlehem history. And uh, in 2022, he became the mayor of Bethlehem, where he has been working and succeeding at making it one of the best places to live in America. Um, uh, Jay William Reynolds, Mayor Jay William Reynolds, thank you so much for coming on. It is it is great to be here. Uh, thank you for hosting. I'm looking forward to a good conversation. But uh, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, it's wonderful to be here. This is this is fantastic. So <laughs> let's start, uh, you know, with your roots. Like we said, you are born and raised Bethlehem. Uh, talk a little bit about your roots and what those mean to you and how they shaped you to kind of be who you are. Yeah, I think that, you know, my story is a story I think of a lot of people in Lehigh Valley. It's my, my dad uh, went to Lehigh, yeah, you know, uh, in the late 60s. My mom went to Cedar Crest. They both uh, came here from New Jersey, you know, 55, 56 years ago. Uh, and then my dad got his uh, PhD and was a professor at Raven for about 40 years. And, uh, you know, so we all grew up. I got four brothers and sisters. We grew up right across from Liberty High School. We all went to Liberty High School. I went to uh, Moravian um, and kind of just been in been in the area, been in the area ever since. Um, but, you know, it's, it's interesting because, you know, my parents have the story that they moved here from somewhere else and I've been here my whole life. Yeah. And I think it really is kind of a microcosm or a symbol of, you know, who so many people are in the Lehigh Valley. Um, and, you know, I think it's helped to shape me. Um, but, you know, I, you know, after I, I got out of college, I was thinking about what I want to do. I, my first job was working for the state representative in Bethlehem, Steve Samuelson. Mm -hmm. So he hired me. I graduated on Saturday. I started working on Monday. <laughs> I was tired. Um, and, uh, you know, I did that job for a couple of years. And then I decided to run for city council um, when I was 25 because I thought that, you know, 
growing up in Bethlehem, you know, we were going through a period of transition, a period of change. Um, and, you know, I'd gone to a meeting or two and, you know, there's nothing wrong with the people up there, but I didn't necessarily think that our generation was being represented in this kind of next generation of decision making. Mm-hmm. Um, and I ran for city council and I did that for 14 years um, until I was like the mayor a couple years ago. So your first job was in politics. Is this something you knew, you know, in high school, this is what I want to do? Or did you kind of just stumble into it? Yeah, my dad was a political science professor. And, um, you know, so so that's what he taught. And so we were very into politics. I will I will make the distinction between politics and working in one of these um, like a state representative's district office is you're helping normal people that walk in off the street that yeah. are like, I got this problem with PennDOT. I'm waiting for my uh, teacher certificate or mm-hmm. whatever it might be. Um, and, you know, once I, once I started to have that experience, I thought to myself, you know, there's so many people that care about our community. Like what's something that I can do to be a part of it, to be a voice. But uh, I always thought I wanted to do something having to do with this space. I didn't know exactly what it was going to be. Um, but it just kind of, it kind of fit from there. And then, you know, one of the things I did that's similar is, you know, after I left, uh, I represent Samuel's office, I taught for 13 years. Yeah. So I taught, you know, over at Allen high school. So I kind of had this dual life as both the public school teacher and then also spending time in city council. Um, and just allowed me to see a lot of, uh, um, the wonderful changes going on in Lehigh Valley, but also meet a lot of wonderful people and realize that, you know, people, no matter if they're 15 or 72 are looking for the same things. And and what are those things? Because I think you've done a great job of focusing them on, uh, in Bethlehem, but I wanted to kind of get your take on yeah. what you think is important. People want to feel like they're part of a community. Mm-hmm. And I think that's sometimes lost in 2024. And there's uh, a, a lot written these days about isolation and people feeling alienated and they're spending time with themselves. But that kind of secret, you know, of the Lehigh Valley and the secret of Bethlehem is the idea that people want to be part of community. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it doesn't matter if you've lived here for, as I say, a week or a year or 50 years, like humans want the same thing. And maybe this is my academic background, but if you've ever seen that, like, uh, you know, if you ever took a psychology class and you saw that, like Maslow's need hierarchy yeah. at the bottom, like, you know, how do we take care of our basic needs? And then we want to be cared for. And then we want to, so like that's, that was on the wall in, in my classroom. And that's a very simple thing that crosses all racial lines, all income lines is people want to be cared for. They want to be a part of community. They want to feel safe and they want to have opportunity. Um, those are universal, I think, basic human values um, or human goals, I should say. And I think that's one of the things that you know we never can forget. And sometimes I think people in politics forget that is just because something's working for you doesn't mean it's working for everybody. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously we all want things to be working for ourselves, for our families, but we're also trying to design things to be like, Okay, so this is my experience, but what's your experience? What's your experience? What's your experience? And you want to always be listening and self-reflecting on what you can do to even be a better listener. So that is something I've noticed. Uh, I attend all of your state of the the city addresses, and one thing I've certainly noticed is we appreciate that. By the way, I love them, like, it, and 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 I say that, and that's not cliche, and that's not the kind of BS that like you know a, a mayor would say, but you know. Oftentimes, the people that are there, and they are also great people, is you have city employees, or you have people that are with law firms, or you have people that you know do different business within the city. They're building things, but to have people there, um, such as yourself from other areas, because you're interested, right. is really a special thing and a thing that we absolutely notice. So I, I do want to thank you for that. Well, if you want to feel excited about the city, like go to one of these. I'm telling the listeners right now, it is inspiring. Um, but what I was saying is. A theme that comes out of that every time is this inclusivity approach that you've taken. Um, And I I don't know that it's been spearheaded in other places, but it seems almost central to what you do. Yeah, it absolutely is central to what I do. And I think it goes back to just like a basic idea of like empathy, but also the idea that all of us, if we don't in social media, all these things like, you know, push us in those directions is, you know, we can get very lost in our own feelings. And I, you know, I, uh, one thing I didn't mention was I played basketball for Liberty. I played basketball for Moravian. And the one thing I learned during those experiences is some years I got to shoot the ball a lot. Some years I was passing. Some years I didn't play as much. Some years I was rooting on my friends. And you don't ever forget those feelings that sometimes like you're the middle, you're the center of attention. And sometimes you're not. And most people are not the center of attention. And that's an experience that they have for the majority of their lives. And it's very important to me that as the mayor and as our administration is that we central everything we do on like, how is everybody else feeling? And of course, you're never going to get everybody to be happy. You're never going to get everybody. And sometimes, you know, you don't want to bend over backwards for people that you want things that just aren't good. 
but you want to start from that place of like, how do we make people feel welcome? Mm -hmm. And I think, and there's obviously been a lot of changes in America in the last 10, 15 years, but one of the best ones is just, there's been a raised awareness of like, how do other people feel? And if I tell you like, no, no, Jimmy, I respect you. Like, no, 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 no. You get to decide right. whether or not you feel respect. It's not just what my intent is, but it's the way it's received. Mm -hmm. And I had just learned that. I think I learned that from teaching and yeah. teaching teenagers for a long time. And I remember at my first couple years, like, I'm a great teacher. Like, <laughs> I know what I'm doing. Yeah. But then, and some kids would say that, but then also I would self-reflect and I would listen to kids and I would read the, you know, the surveys at the end of the year and things like that. And I'd be like, eh, maybe I, maybe I missed this. Maybe yeah. I, maybe I could do this a little bit better. And I think- Oftentimes people in these jobs of leadership think that their job, they need to exhibit this kind of traditional confidence all the time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, I think that's the wrong way to approach it. And that's one of the things that we kind of make central to our administration. Yeah. It, it, so you, you hit on something there that I, I did want to bring up and you know, it's election time, election season, uh, the country feels like it's never been more divided. Yeah. And I thought that last election cycle, um, so it just keeps getting, you know, compounding on itself. How, how did we get here and, and what sort of vision do you see to get us through this? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Please solve the problems the, the of first America. Of the, the first question there is easier to answer than the second one. And I think, and there's obviously been a lot written about this, is that we, and now let me just look at Bethlehem, for example. Yeah. Like once upon a time, we had Bethlehem Steel. And whether or not you worked at Bethlehem Steel or your dad did or your brother did or your uncle did or your cousin did or whatever... It was this common experience mm -hmm. that people were like, oh, the steel. So you were more willing to be a part of a community effort because you looked around, you're like, we're the steel workers. Yeah. We're, we all have this kind of same story. And as we've had kind of a decline of those kind of shared spaces across America, and I think, you know, however you feel, if you're religious or not, like the decline of religion mm -hmm. has been a kind of thing that has like minimized the amount of times that people get together with each other to sit next to each other, listen to them. Um, you know, you don't have these huge industries oftentimes that have tens of thousands of people to create this kind of like shared culture. So I think that, you know, we've kind of slowly become more and more and more of an individual society. I make the comparison during the pandemic, too, is like I think a lot of people during the pandemic realized, you know, it's good to have some time to myself. It's good to be able to self-reflect. It's good to be able to kind of like spend time on myself. But then after a while, it doesn't matter who you are, you realize we're missing something here. And thankfully, we moved beyond it. We got the vaccine and things like that. But we need both of those experiences. We need that individual experience. We need that community experience. And I think one of the things that's happened in America is that, you know, those scales have been tipped where it's become more and more and more of this individual experience about like, how does this affect me? How is this going to affect me? How do I feel right now? And then all of those things that people talk about, social media, 24-hour news cycle, it's just kind of like train people that there's this constant, you know, as I say, there's a group of people now that follow politics the way that people follow the Eagles. Right. They're yelling at the TV. They want the score to be 49 to three. Yeah. They don't want it to be 24, 21. <laughs> they want three hours of just like the other side feeling bad. Yeah. And it's not good because mm -hmm. because government is not sports. Um, and you know, our progress in the Lehigh Valley has been because we've had a very nonpartisan or bipartisan approach to economic development and things like that. But where do we go from here? It's, it's, I, I, I'm going to tell you that I don't know what the answer is yeah. because there are some things that you could say, let's lower the temperature on, but I also will be completely transparent and honest is like, I, I get it that like you and I might disagree, not literally, I don't know, but like we might disagree on tax cuts or foreign policy. Like those are things you can have intellectual conversations on. It just seems that there are two real competing visions for what the future of the culture of America looks and feels like. Yeah. And I don't think, in my personal opinion, and people that I surround, like, there's a lot of issues there that people aren't willing to, and they don't, they shouldn't compromise on. Mm -hmm. And I'm not going to tell somebody, and nobody should tell somebody, like, well, we need to get along, and your rights need to kind of be on pause until we find a way to kind of build back up a relationship. So, in some ways, I think we might be able to find ways to talk about, you know, you know, economic policy and things like that. But, you know, there's a there's a change going on in that American identity and there's changes going on with you know gender norms and all sorts of things that, you know, I think are positive. Not everybody does, but it is it is until that kind of shakes out on a generational way. I think we're going to see some of the same conflict going forward.
Yeah. Well, let's talk about uh, sort of the economic development and, you know, we can disagree on economics. Yeah. I think uh, there's a big idea that Democrats love to spend mm -hmm. and spend and spend and spend and, you know, fiscal responsibility. Forget about it. Yep. Um, going to your addresses, I have seen that is not the case. Yeah. You are spending, you are doing public works and improving the community. Yep. Um, but talk a little bit about, you know, whether it's the the debt that you've lowered or sort of this the the actions that you've taken from a fiscal perspective. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, City of Bethlehem went through some tough economic times. I mean, for decades, as the steel was declining, I mean, we were built around Bethlehem Steel, not only with the literal jobs that people were working there, but I mean, Bethlehem Steel used one third of our water. So, I mean, that's a huge revenue yeah. source that when they shut down. So Bethlehem had to make some tough decisions. We had to borrow money to make sure we could pay our pensions and pay our medical and things like that. And then over the last 20 years, through public-private partnerships, which is one of the keys, is that, you know, I don't care who you are. Like, when you're in the public sector, you need to work with the private sector. You need to be like, what is it that you need to for your business to be able to bring jobs here? Because when you can bring jobs here and then you're paying your employees and you're paying property taxes, that's what funds our police officers and our firefighters and our roads and things like that. So I've never looked at budgeting as a particular ideological thing as much as a math problem. Mm -hmm. And, you know, next Wednesday, actually, there's a, a plug for our budget address is, you know, I'm going to deliver the budget address again. And I'm going to talk about how, like, we have these financial rules. And one of those is you got to pay sustainable expenses with sustainable revenues. And, you know, just like you would want to do in your house, like yeah. you wouldn't be like, ah, I won the lottery, $1,500. I'm going to go pay my mortgage this month. Like, mm -hmm. that's, that's a recipe for disaster. So what we look at is very much, what's the real answer? What, how do we handle this from a sophisticated point of view? Sometimes you got to make tough decisions in the short term and not everybody likes it. But then you talk about what the long term, the long term assistance is. And yet it, you kind of mentioned this in 2015, we had like $170 million in debt. We have paid off aggressively to get under $90 million. And within three years, we're going down to like $55 million, wow. which is a revenue to debt ratio that you don't see in any other city. But it's because we've had mayors and people in city council that are like, let's make sure that we never forget that, you know, there's always a next year. Mm -hmm. There's always two years from now and three years from now and five years from now. And it's like anything else we do in our own personal life. If you're willing to kind of be responsible in the short term, over the long term, you can do more and more of the things you want to do. And that's what we're doing in Bethlehem. We've gone through this is, and I always say, it's like, I'm just the latest guy. This is like chapter like 27 in this revitalization. <laughs> So all of these good decisions people have made, the benefit is seen down the road and, you know, maybe not, not a lot of people probably looking through the budgets, but it's people see it and they feel it. Um, and I am very committed to that idea that running a city budget is not a liberal or conservative thing. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, I mean, my mom was a math teacher. My dad taught politics, but my mom taught math. Yeah. And she said like, no, no, math is math. <laughs> like, 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 like you can't like you can't lie. Like yeah. one plus one will never equal three. And eventually people and, and eventually that catches up with people if you if you try to do that. What are you most proud of? You've accomplished a lot in your short tenure. Like what yeah. are you most proud of? Whether it's your life or as mayor. I mean, what if you had to pick? Yeah. I on the personal side, I have a wonderful wife, Natalie, and we have a uh, young son, Leo, who's about 14 months old and those are definitely the things that I feel the most joy in being involved in. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, you know, I, we live in Bethlehem, I, you know, Leo's going to William Penn down the street from where we live when, in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I'm just incredibly, I'm incredibly, um, you know, fortunate and happy that I with, 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 with where we are as a family, I would say as far as being a mayor is concerned, is that, and this comes down to probably just being a citizen in Bethlehem, is like, we have so many people that pay attention in the best way possible, and so many people that want to be a part of something that's bigger than them. Mm -hmm. And that's what a community needs, yeah. is people that wake up in the morning and be like, hey, I want to be a part of this thing. I don't need credit for it. But you know what? This afternoon, I'm going to look back and be like, hey, I spent my morning doing it for a couple hours, doing something that really helped out the park or helped out the community or helped out my church and things like that. And when I go around, People are, they, they thank me. And this, once again, sounds like the kind of like BS a mayor would say, but like I turn around, I'm like, no, 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 no. Like what makes my job so much easier than mayors in so many other places that we have so many people that wake up in the morning that are like, I want to be a part of this thing. 
Yeah. I want to coach my little league team. I want to coach, you know, the basketball team. I want to, you know, we're going to put in this community garden at our church. Like all of those little things add up, add up, add up, add up to create this overall vibe of positivity that we have in the city. Mm-hmm. And that's the thing that we've never lost. And yeah. I think that was the thing, even when steel went down and things like that, that's the thing I think I'm probably the most proud of. And when people come to Bethlehem and I think the Leah Valley is like this as a whole, but it's particularly true in Bethlehem, um, that, there's like that vibe of positivity, the vibe mm-hmm. of community that's unique that yeah. you don't get everywhere. And that's probably the thing I'm the most proud of. That's awesome. Yeah. Where, where do you find the time? Like I'm, I'm tired listening to you. Um, and you know, you have so many people counting on you, right? Mm-hmm. You have a family, as you yeah. mentioned, you have Leo at home. Um, you play basketball, I'm sure in your spare time, like how, how do you time manage and, and take, the responsibility for all of this. Uh, yeah. Now this is what a mayor would say. It's like <laughs> my wife has a more difficult life than I do. I mean, <laughs> she's a family physician at Leah Valley Health Network. So mm-hmm. she is working and helping people in a in a way that allows me um sometimes the opportunity to to be a little bit more flexible. But you know, it is it's not easy. And I would say, but I'm also not unique. And I, and I don't try to, I think there's a lot of people too, that are, you know, uh, it's, you know, sleep hasn't always been great over the last year with the baby. <laughs> I, know, I think as anybody at home would, would, would tell you, but it is, I think it's just the experience a lot of people have. I mean, we got streets workers that show up and lay blacktop for eight hours a day. Yeah. And then they go and they coach their kids little league team and then they sleep and then they wake up and they go do it again. So I think that, you know, the hard work idea about doing things is just, you know, part of part of who we are. And, you know, there are days when I'm tired, but I do a lot of running. Running is like the most important thing to just clear my mind. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's uh, it's I think I think I share a Leah Valley work ethic with a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, but I will also say. A lot of things in my job, people think are work like, oh my God, thanks for showing up. I'm like, no, 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 this is fun. <laughs> like, this is what you would do if you weren't the mayor. Yeah. Like, oh, you came out to our block party or you came out to our concert or mm-hmm. like you came out to like, no, 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 that's what you would want to do anyway. Yeah. You know, it just happens to be, um, happens to be what it is that, uh, that's part of the job. Yep. No, that's great. What, um, what are your top priorities as you look out towards, you know, the second half of your first term. Um, what what are your top priorities? Yeah, continuing to make smart decisions. I think is that oftentimes, you know, I do believe that people become cynical when governments make short term decisions. And one of the things that I've always proud pride ourselves on is the idea that we make sophisticated decisions. That if you ask us why did you do that, we could explain in a way. And I think that hopefully has come through in the budget address in the state of the cities. Is there's always a plan. Mm-hmm. And I look at it as we're going to continue to work with the private sector. We're going to continue to budget well. We're, you know, some of the things that we're really excited about now is um, if you're in Bethlehem, you know that we've some beautiful new parks facilities. Yeah. We have Memorial Pool, which is beautiful. We have Fairview Park. We just bought the last part of the Greenway uh, last week. Um, so we have all of these kind of a level amenities. So we're doing a citywide parks master plan to be able to kind of like build networks of parks. How are we doing different things there? We are also launching a, um, a citywide bike, uh, uh, master plan. Um, that's going to be able to connect all of our city. You're a big biker. Uh, I, I love to bike. Um, and I love to, I also just love to see people biking Mm -hmm. because I think that's one of the things that like shows you're part of like a community. Yeah. You're not like just driving through. And um, so we're doing a bunch of these things now that you couldn't have done 15, 20 years ago, because then once we come up with those plans, Mm -hmm. we're like, okay, so then these are the parks we can rebuild in, you know, 25 and 26. These are the streets we can kind of redo. Um, So we're kind of really looking forward to how do you kind, how do you invest in that infrastructure for a long time? You know, there was a period not to get too historical on you, but I mean, Great Depression afterwards, there was all this money coming from the federal government to be able to rebuild so many public works projects. And then for decades, cities didn't have any money. And now because of some of the action of the federal government that has been positive about investing in cities, we now have the resources to really create these like a level amenities Mm -hmm. um, that people just want to be a part of. And that's what you want in your neighborhood is you want this awesome park. You want the new pool. You want the bike lanes. You want those things. And that's what we're going to be focusing on. The basketball courts. The basketball courts. Absolutely. And no double rims. (laughs) This is like one of my things. Yeah. And and it's, you know, we joke around about is like no basketball court should ever have a double rim. (laughs) They're the worst but there it's also symbolic is like the difference between buying a double rim and buying a rim that's slightly more expensive versus the experience is like 
don't just buy the cheapest thing. Right. Because when you buy the cheapest thing, it gives off the message to the public that public spaces are cheap. Hmm. Like these aren't things that you value. Yeah. So sometimes you can spend just like a little bit more money. So rather than paying like $39 for the rim, yeah. like just pay like $65 for the rim. Mm-hmm. And then people come by and they say, look, this is clearly a respect factor. People want us to. Um, you can't always put glass backboards everywhere. We have a couple of parks that we have those in now. But like you want to invest in a way because then people take care of it. They have this mm-hmm. they have this real sense of pride. And like parks that are depressing, like can depress your whole neighborhood. Yeah. So so we're we're that's kind of our philosophy. Yeah. So I, I wanted to do something. Um, you know, there is an election coming up. And so yeah. voting is very important. Yep. And we have some issues that we thought we would like to get your vote on. Absolutely. Um, and so Avery is going to take this and run. This is basically a this or that segment. I'm going to scoot over here. Oh, get on that camera. Not, like, totally not looking at the- <laughs> <laughs> You're better at this than I am. All right. So we'll do a speed round. We'll try to do this <laughs> under a minute. Absolutely. Yes. My goal is to do it in 45 seconds. So as soon the as, whole thing, the whole thing. So okay. as soon as I give you an option, it needs to just yep. be whatever is first to your yep. mind. All right. Yep. All right. <clears throat> Ready? Yes. Yakos or pots hot dogs? Pots. <laughs> Lehigh Valley Iron Pigs or Lehigh Valley Phantoms? Iron Pigs. Aardvark Sports Shop or The Running Company? Aardvark. Lehigh Valley Zoo or Da Vinci Center? Da Vinci Center. Music Fest or Oktoberfest? Music Fest. Ooh, <laughs> Coke or Pepsi? Coke, but I don't drink less soda. Oh, Joel Embiid or Tyrese Maxey? Oh, great question. <laughs> I am, I'm going with Maxey on that one. <laughs> Eagles or Phillies? Eagles. Uh, whoopie pies or shoe fly pie? Shoe fly pies. Natalie Bieber or Justin Bieber? Natalie Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> uh, road cycling or a casual bike ride? Casual bike ride. Ice cream or frozen yogurt? Ice cream. Pineapple or pizza? Yes or no? Uh, no. Good. Liberty High School or Freedom High School? Oh, Liberty Freedom's on Saturday. Liberty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Now, if you want to turn to one of the cameras, you can absolutely go ahead and tell people to get out there and vote if you'd like. Absolutely. So we have we have an election coming up. Uh, it's in a little bit less than two weeks. Um, and it's America. And we have this wonderful ability to go out and vote. Uh, for all of the different races that are on the ballot in November. So whether or not you're returning your mail-in ballot or you're getting out there uh, in a couple of weeks, get out, utilize that American right that so many people across the, the world don't have, uh, and vote. That was perfect. <laughs> um, you also answered all the culinary questions on there correctly. I was, I was a little nervous, but we're going to be okay. Um, it was I, a big debate here. I was surprised about the shoe fly pie. I mean, yeah. my mom used to make a shoe fly pie. Oh, oh really? So, right. yeah. So, that's... My uh, mom used to be a whoopie pie woman. Uh, so, I, I was already with you so there's all sorts... You know, that's it's kind of what you grew up with, I think. For yeah, better or worse. Funny. Yes. Um, one thing that we have to talk about and we haven't hit yet is the UNESCO um, you know, World Heritage yes. Site. Uh, you're a Moravian guy, mm-hmm. uh, and so seeing this recognition, you know, on the the international level is yeah. really cool. Um, just your thoughts on that? I wanted to pick your brain. Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Like so many successes in Bethlehem, it's not something that started two years ago when I came into office. It's you know, it's something that's people have been working on for decades. Charlene Donches Mowers with Historic Bethlehem Museums and Sites really was the person that kind of um, started this initiative and took it, and you know. It is obviously something that we are super, super excited about in the city of Bethlehem. You know, the city was founded by Moravians, but the the, the tenets and the morals of the Moravians, this idea of community, of equality, those reach beyond just the Moravians. And the majority of the people in our city are not Moravian, but the majority of the people in our city believe in the idea of community and equality. Yeah. And uh, one of the cool things about our transnational World Heritage Site, so there are 26 World Heritage Sites now in the United States. We are the only transnational one. Wow. I know. It's, it's, it's fantastic. So our partners in um, Northern Ireland, Denmark, and Germany, um, who also had original Moravian settlements, you know, we have spent a lot of time with them. Last week, they were in for kind of the official mm-hmm. inscription event, the signing of uh, um, you know, the documents and things like that, that we you know, celebrated this idea that community here is the same as community in Northern Ireland or Denmark or Germany, back to that idea about people. And one of the, I don't know if share of challenges, but opportunities is like, how do we make world heritage work for all 78,000 people? Because you have a lot of people that aren't not Moravian, right. that look at this as a, you know, we are a combination of cultures, a combination of identities. One of the, um, uh, one of the Moravian ministers from Denmark put it perfectly last week where he said, culture is a conversation. And I thought that just summed mm-hmm. it up just 
in, in the most perfect way possible. I never heard it that simplified before, but he's like, culture is a conversation. And this is an opportunity, I think, for us as we move forward as a city, like so many places across America, to have conversations about what community means. Um, so people look at World Heritage like we're going to welcome people and people are going to come from all over and so on and so forth. And we will have some people that come here. The bigger opportunity in my mind for us is an internal one as far as like what the values are that the world has now recognized us for yeah. to live up to. Yeah. And that idea about like, how do we make sure everybody feels included? How do we make sure everybody has opportunity? How do we make sure? I mean, you've probably heard this before at God's Acre, you will have people that were rich and poor that were buried next to each other. Mm -hmm. um, and that just doesn't happen usually in 2024. Yeah. And I think it's a, it's a real opportunity for us internally as well to kind of think about who we want to be as a city. So I, I've been listening to you talk and I, I wrote three things, three words that I feel like encapsulate who you are as a person what but i'd like to pick your brain like what do you think who who are you like if you had to sum yourself down you know to three words who do you feel like you are that's a good question um i think that i am somebody that is uh community minded check <laughs> <laughs> uh i am somebody that is self-reflective okay um and I am somebody that is, uh, I'd like to like to believe that I'm somebody that is committed to causes other than my own. And I always, I always, you know, I, I, it's never trying to pat oneself on the back. So this is a, this is a dynamic that I think you see throughout Bethlehem that it's like, once you kind of have yours, like how do you help other people get theirs? Yeah. And that's kind of the way that, you know, Natalie and I and my mom and everybody I know like feels about it mm -hmm. is like, you know, once things are okay for you, like the best we can feel oftentimes, and we're working for things to help other people. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I think I said this before, I, I was a teacher at Allen and, you know, people often would say like, how could you teach teenagers? How could, cause, like, cause there's no better feeling mm. than helping like a 15 or 16 or 17 year old, like accomplish anything. Yeah. And I think that that's kind of how, like, I kind of view, view my work as well. Yeah. Empathy. That was the word I wrote, yes. which I think yeah. it, it kind of sums that up. I mean, you do take other people's thoughts and feelings into consideration in all of your decisions. Yeah. Um, uh, the one that I had that you didn't have was inspiration. And I mean that in the sense, like I thought passion, I thought, uh, you know, you're very dedicated to things you get passionate, but I think it's so infectious that it inspires the people around you. So uh, inspiration was the other one that I had. I appreciate that. Um, so we are like shockingly running out of time. Um, I've enjoyed every minute of this. We are sponsored by Hocus Pocus Cleaning Service. Mm -hmm. It's a, a female owned cleaning company in the area. Um, they do incredible work and they do this thing. It's called witching hour where you have a messy closet or whatever. They'll come in and they'll reorganize it for you. Um, it's basically magic. Mm -hmm. And so I ask everyone on here, if you could have any magical ability and we are approaching Halloween, um, what would your magical ability be? It's a good question. Um, I would probably say, let me think about this for a second. <laughs> um, I would probably say that the ability to see the future. Yeah. And that's a first here. And, and, and it's not a see the future in a, you know, like back to the future part two, like right. how do we what's like, you know, like, like what's the lottery? Yeah, like, yeah. you know, who's going to win the world series in 2031? Like, <laughs> I don't want that. I just think that oftentimes, like we think back to decisions we made mm -hmm. and we think, oh my gosh, that was the, that was the best, you know, that was, that, that was something that, you know, we thought was best at the time, but if we knew what was going to happen, we would have done A, B or C and right. nobody's fault. Like you're doing the best you can at the time. Yeah. It just saves time and feelings and energy. If you kind of could see where things are going yeah. a little bit, at least in a couple of things. Yes. You know, yeah. You know? So I would probably. I would probably say that other than, I don't know. Can you, can you, you're going to laugh at this. Can you put more hours in the day? I like would it, love it. it it's yeah. like, that's, that's, that, that's what I would like. Cause then if the biggest problem I have now is sleep. Yes. So, and like, I love Leo to death. Right. And you know, my wife, as I said, takes even on more than I do. Yeah. But like, we just need a few more hours. Like I need like a 26 hour day, <laughs> like a 26 and a half hour day. How is he as a sleeper? 
he, I think, is like most little guys. Yeah. See, like he kind of goes back and forth. Like yeah. he'll have good weeks, and then you know maybe he won't be feeling great. He'll be getting a tooth or things like that. Mm-hmm. But you know, and I can't really blame him. Like once he's up, then like he's just like up. ready to go. He's like, I'm ready to go. Yeah. And then people have told me, and Natalie's like, well. Look, you, look, like, what do you, what do you, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, what do you think? Uh-huh. He was going to be like, ah, I'm not chilling. He's like, you know, like, yeah, baby, yeah, 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 yeah. I'm going to sit over here and read Lord of the Rings. Like, you know, <laughs> like I'm going to go, I'm going to go do things. So he's, yeah. he's, he's doing okay, but he's, he's a joy every day. Yeah, it is. It's fun, but you're right. I, I remember our first, like, did not sleep at all. And I don't know why we had more after yeah. that, but yeah. you do, you forget about it. And yeah. I love them so much. You just keep yeah. going. So I think it's, a, I'm one of five. Yeah. So my mom, God bless her. Greatest grandma ever. Like once in a while, she also puts in perspective. She's mm-hmm. just like, yeah. Like one day you will wish that yeah. the biggest problem you have at three in the morning with your child <laughs> is the fact that they won't sleep. It's like one day. The problems you, change. Huh? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Small kids, small problems. Yep. Big kids, big problems. Yeah. So, <laughs> it happens so fast. You don't even realize. Like yeah. uh, I'm watching my kids grow up and everyone tells you it happens fast. And now I have a 10 year old. I'm like, where did this happen? Yeah. 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 It's, it's cool. Yeah. So anything we didn't hit that we should hit? Um, anything you want to talk about? No, I just really appreciate the conversation. I know you have a bunch of different people in here to talk about a bunch of different issues and, you know, and just the, the kind of podcast world. It's like it is a community builder. Yeah. And I think that you do it in a positive way. Um, this isn't like a Facebook group. It's not like just like what's going on, you know, and, you know, on the Hamilton Boulevard. It's, it's, it is a positive kind of we're celebrating things that are going on. And 100%. I, I just want to I want to thank you for that, because like each one of these things really does add up to create the kind of community that you want to live in. Yeah. Um, that people want. And uh, so I just want to I want to thank you for that. Well, I appreciate that. I, I'm thanking you for coming on. Like yeah. I said, you've got a, a ton of of things to do. So for you making the time, we appreciate it. I got one last question for you. Yeah. Are you dressing up for Halloween? Yes. What are you dressing up as? We're doing Disney villains. So I'm going to be, I mean, if you look at me, I think it's pretty obvious I would be Gaston. Given the size <laughs> of the muscles. Um, so that is what I am being. <laughs> okay. How about you? Uh, I actually still, and I mean, I'm, I'm running out of time, but I don't know what I'm going to do yet. Gotcha. So Leo though is dressing up as a, uh, uh, mail-in, uh, drop-off box. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 and I will tell you that I wanted to, um, Natalie has him wearing it for the Halloween parade, which is on Sunday. And then, um, uh, you know, maybe one other time I wanted him to wear it for all like 37 days leading up to the election <laughs> when you could return your mail-in ballot to remind people because people are like, that guy's crazy. That little kid's wearing that mail-in box every <laughs> single day. But Natalie responsibly said, we're not doing that. Yeah. You have to have a, a sensible half. Yes. Oh. She's the, she's the. Awesome. Well, thank you again. This was great. I loved every minute of it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to another episode of the Why Am I Talking podcast. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more content from amazing personalities in the Valley, please subscribe, leave a rating, and drop us a quick review. 